We thank the Lord for our Bible study again today. We praise his name because he has preserved our lives. And here we are today. I want you to please uh, rise up as we pray together. And you want to commit yourself and the Bible study to the Lord in prayer. That the Lord will give us what is best. And then we ourselves will respond in the way he wants us to respond. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for our Bible study tonight. We bless your name. Because we preserved our lives. You are glorified, O oh Lord. You are exalted. And we are praying, O oh Lord, that tonight your spirit will take these words. Very few verses and short verses. Lord, we pray that these verses will mean a lot to us in our lives uh, this um, uh, month and this year. And as our days uh, go on in the Lord in Jesus' name. Amen. We are asking, O oh Lord, that you breathe on this word. And you impact on us everything you want us to receive and have through this word in Jesus' name. Amen. Lead us, Lord, in the study. Help us to receive everything you've got for us. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. The people of God said, Amen. Amen. We're looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Three verses of scriptures today. Verse 16, verse 17, and verse 18. Open your Bible as we read together. It says, Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Those are the verses we're looking at. Very short verses indeed. But then they reveal great reality of being true or the true children of God. Without the new birth, Without an unmistakable experience of conversion through Christ's transforming grace, who can rejoice evermore? Tell me, who can pray without ceasing? And tell me, who can give thanks in everything? As we look at these verses, we know that these verses actually require that there should have been the touch of God upon our lives. There should have been the glory of God in our lives. There should have been the very presence of an abiding Christ in our lives before we can pray without ceasing, and before we can rejoice evermore, and before we can give thanks in everything. Think about the things that happen in life. And then the Lord is saying, give thanks, give thanks, give thanks, every time, at all times, in all things. Now, it, the natural man will not be able to do this. That is, the unsaved descendant of Adam is prone to complaining every time because is prayerless, except in critical moments, is always unthankful, even after receiving unmerited favors from the Lord, is always unthankful. But it is the child of God. It is the one that is born again. It is the one that has the transforming power of the Lord working in his life. That is a person that can actually do all these things and obey these commandments that we are reading about today. But then you are going to see that these commandments are not giving us in vain. They are giving to us so that we will be able to do them. And then when we do them, you are going to see great, wonderful results as a result of obeying these commandments. But it's only when we are transformed, when we have been changed, and when there's real, genuine conversion. It is in such a person that the carnal nature has been crucified, and the carnal nature has been rendered impotent and inactive. It is such a person that will be able to obey what the Lord by his Spirit is telling us today in these verses that we are reading. It's the spiritually minded who is indwelt by the Holy Spirit who can rejoice evermore. It is such a person who is not living a carnal life, a fleshly life, a natural life, who is not living just by the dictates of his own mind. It is such a person that can pray without ceasing. You'll see the reason to depend upon the Lord without ceasing. You'll see the reason to be dependent upon the grace of God, upon the goodness of God, upon the promises of God without ceasing. And that's why he's going to be praying, asking for the favor of God, asking for the mercy of God, asking for the love of God, asking for the grace that will sustain him in every situation at all times. And he's such a person that is able to give thanks as God answers his prayer, as things arise that he doesn't understand, but he's rejoicing the very fact that God understands what he does not understand. That is a kind of person that prays without ceasing, rejoicing evermore, and in everything he is giving thanks. Then he tells us in that verse 18, 
As you look at the end of verse 18, it says, For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Would you want to personalize that and understand whatever other people do, however other people respond or react, that we know for me, this is the will of God. Others may not understand that this is the will of God for them. Others may not understand this is how to live the spiritual life, the fruitful life, and the Christ glorifying God or the uh, Christ glorifying life, that this is the way to live. But for us, this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning us, concerning each of us. Can I talk about that will of God for a moment before we move on from point to point? Number one, we need to know the foundation of the will of God in our lives. The foundation of the will of God is our salvation. I would not be able to pray without ceasing if you are not born again. How would you be able to rejoice evermore if you are not born again? How would you be able uh, to give thanks in everything if you have not experienced the primary, the foundational will of God in your life, which is being born again? Let me show you from the scriptures that the will of God is our salvation. In First Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. First Timothy chapter 2. Verses 3 and 4, it says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. The will of God for you, my brother, the will of God for you, my sister, is that you are born again. Is that your past life will be past and the new life will be the present thing in your life. In Second Peter chapter 3 verse 9, still talking about the will of God, which is your repentance, the will of God, which is your righteousness, the will of God, which is your redemption, the will of God, which is your salvation. This is the foundation of the will of God. In fact, it will be very difficult. It will be near impossible to find the will of God in any other area of your life if you have not responded to the will of God in salvation. In Second Peter chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 9, it says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering towards what, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance coming to repentance that is the will of god there are some people that will say they don't know whether they are predestined or predestinated for salvation or not that tells us that god is not willing that you should perish god is not willing that anyone should perish he wants everyone to come to the knowledge of salvation knowledge of repentance and knowledge of righteousness in christ but the next uh, will of god that you'll see in the word of god is in first thessalonians chapter 4 verse 3 first thessalonians chapter 4 verse 3 it says for this is the will of god even your sanctification it saves us as his will it brings us to the Lord does His will, and then it makes a real transformation change in our lives. We we'll become new creatures in Christ. That is His will. And then He goes on and changes us on the inside. He makes sure that the blood of Jesus Christ applied the second time on our heart, in our life, on the inner man, sanctifies and purifies and makes us holy through and through. And it says, this is the will of God. And we're instructed that we should know the will of God. We shall seek that will and know that will and live in that will and abide in that will. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 17. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of God or the will of the Lord is. Be not unwise, but be understanding what the will of the Lord is. And in the passage we are reading today, what's the will of the Lord? To rejoice evermore. What's the will of the Lord? To pray without ceasing. What's the will of the Lord? That in everything we'll be giving thanks because especially, peculiarly, in a unique way, in a unique manner, in a peculiar manner, this is the will of God concerning you in Christ Jesus. We're going to look at the study today, and we're looking at verse 16. That point gives us the attitude of rejoicing in all trials. The attitude of rejoicing in all trials. And then we come to point number two, which is the admonition on praying at all times. At all times, praying. Praying without ceasing. And then point number three, we're looking at the affirmation of thanksgiving in all things. 
the affirmation of thanksgiving in all things. Let's come back to point number one. We're looking at uh, First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16. It says, Rejoice evermore. Rejoice evermore. You'll see in this subtitle, there is the attitude of rejoicing in all things. As I look at that word attitude, I'm sure you've heard of, you have heard it from me before, that if you will assign the um, figures to each of the letters of the alphabet, 1 to A, and then 2 to B, and 3 to C, and 4 to D, and so on, until you get to uh, the last um, letter, which is Z, you're going to find that as you add the uh, figures, making attitude, as you add that together, you're going to have 100, which means if you're going to live the complete life, the perfect life, the mature life, a kind of 100% life, your attitude is very important. And that is what this is telling us today. As it says, we should rejoice evermore. And as I look at that word attitude, I want to bring some other words uh, to your attention. They all finish with tude. Attitude, that's a word with tude. Beatitude. That is, as you look at Matthew chapter 5, all through verses 3 to, verses 3 to 16. You're having some beatitudes there. Then there's another word that we call aptitude. That is, uh, you know, your skill, your ability. When he talks about the bishop, for example, is apt to teach. At the beginning of the word aptitude. And then he talks about plenitude. That's the fullness that the Lord gives us. He says, the thief commit no but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it abundantly. That's talking about the fullness and the plenitude of what he wants to give us. There's something that is very important. As we go through life, you're going to find that fortitude is very important. That means the courage and the stamina. That means the resilience. We go through life. Uh, people are throwing things on you. Trials are there. Tribul tribulations are there. And some kind of difficulties are there. You have the fortitude to be able to stand. And then there's the magnitude, which means that, you know, even though all those things are happening, as you are rejoicing always, you'll find that the Lord is doing some great things in your life, and we have the magnitude, and then where you reach eventually, as you are climbing up and climbing up, you find that some people are climbing mountains and they reach the top. When they reach the top or the peak, we say they are now at the altitude. Now, as we bring all that together, I'm looking at this, and it says, Rejoice evermore. What's he telling you that if you're going to reach that altitude eventually, number one, I'm talking about attitude in all trials attitude in all trials that whatever you face i'm sure that you know you maybe you're facing something today my brother i understand my sister I understand all of us will pass through that and, you know once in a while in life there's a trial that will say how did this happen how did that happen and my heart goes out to the people that maybe you've lost somebody in the family a wife a husband a child and somebody very dear to you that's a great great trial and sometimes it's so overwhelming the pressure is so great that what am I going to do? Well, I want to tell my brother, I know it's not a kind of situation we should, you know, be rejoicing about, but it says, in spite of it, in spite of all the sorrow, in spite of the sadness, in spite of everything that might have happened, there is the attitude we ought to have in all in all trials. Number two is the beatitude at all times. Beatitudes at all times. Blessed are the people who are poor in spirit and blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness and Blessed are those placemakers, and then blessed are the people who rejoice when they slander you, when you are persecuted, and when they say all manner of evil against you. That's what the Lord is telling us. There is the attitude in all trials. There is the beatitudes at all times, and then there is the aptitude with all truth. The aptitude with all truth. You know, all the skill the Lord has given us, the ability He has given us, the aptitude He has given us, join that with truth. And then you are matching with the skill on the one hand, and then the scripture on the other hand. With the aptitude on the one hand, and then the truth on the other hand, and then you are going to come to the plenitude with all triumph. That is, Yes, I know it's trial. If you will have the right attitude during the trial and you are rejoicing before the Lord, you are going to find eventually the fullness of the Lord, the goodness of the Lord, and the fulfillment of the promises of the Lord when you become triumphant. But then as you go on, there's going to be fortitude with all trust. Fortitude with all trust. You are trusting the Lord. That's why you are courageous. 
You tell me when when uh, this man, this young man, is David. His name is David. He came before Goliath because of the kind of trust he had in the Lord. He said, I can face this. I faced the lion before. I faced the bear before. And I overcame. Because of that, he had fortitude. Because of the trust he had in the Lord. And so bring all that together. This is what makes us rejoice. Some people do not know the secret of rejoicing. In all trials, they just, they just think that when the Bible Bible says rejoice evermore. Rejoice every time. And rejoice at all times in your life. When things are up and when things are down. When it appears there's adversity instead of prosperity. When it appears there's sorrow and sadness instead of gladness. When it appears that all your friends are gone and the foes are ever near. How can you rejoice at such a time? Is the trust we have in the Lord. He knows the best. He's doing the best. And he's orchestrating the best for my life. That is when, when you have lost somebody. You say he understands. I don't understand. He knew this ahead of time. And known unto him and all his, all his works. From the foundation of the, of the world. And then he knows what he's planning for you in the future. Your wife has gone on to glory. You are still here. You are trusting the Lord. And with fortitude. You are moving on. You know that things are good. Going to be are going to be better for you. You're not thinking the world is collapsing because she is gone, because he is gone, and because I've lost that child. It means that there's nothing else I can think of anymore. Rejoice in the Lord. This is only the believer that can do this. The believer that is trusting the Lord, that can face the future with fortitude and then the magnitude in all sorts. The magnitude in all thoughts. You know, sometimes it's the thoughts that give us away. But when your thoughts are magnified, as, magni as uh, magnified as the promises of the Lord, and when your thoughts are as high as the promises, as deep as the promises of God, as wide as the promises of God, as all encompassing as the promises of God, and it's, magni it's magnified, the magnitude in all thoughts, and then the altitude in all things. And that's why, wherever you are, here you are. You are down in the valley today, you are there on the mountain tomorrow, and you are there in the foreign country tomorrow, and then you are here in your home country, anywhere you are, there is that altitude you are able to get to in all things because of this attitude of rejoicing in all trials. Come back to this verse again. I'm looking at First Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 16. It says, rejoice evermore. Think about that. Rejoice evermore, evermore. Let's look at Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6, and I'm reading here from verse 22 and verse 23. And this is what the Lord told his own disciples. And if you are a child of God, then this is what the Lord, by extension, is telling you as well. And this is what he's telling me too. We all go through some of these things sometimes. Sometimes there's persecution. Sometimes misunderstanding. Sometimes slander. Uh, it's, it's not an easy thing when you hear your name being caught in pieces and then your life all being maligned and there's all this slander and this and that. And they accuse you of things you don't know anything about. The natural thing for the natural man, for the natural mind, and for the people that do not know any better. And the people that think that all the future is here today. What is happening to me today will be what will be happening tomorrow. And there's no hope. And there's no future. And there's no goal. All such people cannot rejoice. But the people that know I have a future. There is a destiny. And there's the Lord Almighty in front ahead of me. Because of that whatever my enemies say. Whatever my persecutors do. I tell you I can rejoice in the Lord. Look at the words of Jesus in Luke chapter 6 and verse 22. It says, Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you and cast you out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. It says in verse 23, Rejoice ye in that day, and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For in the like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. It says that when this is come against your life, when these things come against you, that you come into the company of the people, of the prophets of God, of the patriarchs of old, of the saints of old that lived in such a way, in such a way that they glorified God, but the enemies of God and the enemies of righteousness, they persecuted them. He said, rejoice in that day. He goes beyond rejoicing. He says, live for joy, jump for joy. That is, you should be excited when things are happening like that because great will be your reward in 
heaven. You know, while the people of the world are grumbling and complaining and sorrowful and they're crying and they're all mourning because look at what happened to me. Well, look at what they're saying about me. And look at the challenges I'm facing. The Lord is saying, it's such a time you ought to be able to rejoice and in fact you live for joy. But I'm going to tell you something. It's only the saints can, that can do this. And it's only the saints that ought to do this. This divinely inspired command is given to believers who can truly rejoice because their names are written in heaven. Look at Luke chapter 10 and see what the Lord is saying. That if you are going to rejoice, I'm sure that you are not telling the sinners because they are sinners to rejoice because they are sinners. You are not telling somebody that has condemnation all over him because it says, he that believeth not is condemned already. You are not telling somebody under condemnation and somebody under the wrath of God somebody who is on his way to hellfire, somebody at the brink of perdition. You're not telling such a person to rejoice, but Paul the Apostle was writing to believers. He says, you are brethren. He told us in the earlier verse of that passage you are reading, he says, you are brethren. And because we are brethren, our names are written in heaven. We have a goal. We have glory waiting for us. He says, because of that, rejoice evermore. But for the people who are unbelievers, for the people who are sinners, he said that sudden destruction will come upon them as travail upon a woman with child and it says they shall not escape can you tell somebody who is a house is burning can you tell somebody that the house is burning on him and is going to perdition and punishment eternal can you tell the person to rejoice evermore you might as well then announce to the people in hellfire right now that are burning and their one will never die and the punishment will never end you might as well go to them and say rejoice evermore for being in hell no it's not telling the children of wrath and the children of this world and the people that have no hope in Christ. It's not telling them to rejoice evermore. It's telling the people who are children of God, whose names are written in the book of life in heaven. It's telling them rejoice evermore. Let's come to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 17. And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from the from heaven. And he says, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Look at verse 20. Notwithstanding, in this rejoice not. He said, those are temporary things, healing, deliverance, Miracles, signs, wonders, and all those provisions, they are here for the of, for earth, of earth, and they are for the world. And you say, but notwithstanding in that rejoice not that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Rejoice because your names are written in heaven. And that's why those apostles and disciples of old, that's why they rejoice in persecution, in trial, in tribulation. When things happen, they couldn't understand. That's why they rejoice in Acts of the Apostles chapter 5. The apostles had been preaching the word of the Lord and the people of authority, that is religious authority, members of the Sanhedrin, and those leaders in the temple, they now fought against them. In fact, we're told that they beat them. But what did they do? Were they crying? Were they sorrowful? Were they accusing a God uh, without uh, knowledge? Were they saying, oh God, why did you allow this to happen? How could this have happened to me? No. Look at what they were doing. Acts of the Apostles chapter 5. I mean, in there from verse 40, and to him they agreed. And when they had called the apostles and beating them. They commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. They beat them. And you know the people that uh, do not have real sound Christian faith or the people that are not standing firmly in the Lord. If anything happens like that to them you preached and then because of the preaching you preach right and people are coming to know the Lord and more Jesus are knowing the Lord. A church is being planted there another church being planted there and then in the midst of all that in the midst of serving the Lord, in the midst of acting righteously, in the midst of carrying out days, uh, uh, discipling a whole nation done, in the midst of, you know, getting so saved and discipling people and training workers and doing this and that, a calamity occurred. There are some people that say, if this happened, when the year I was giving my best to the Lord, the year I was actually winning souls and the year I was actually spending everything I've God has spent, and yet this will happen. I don't think I'm going to serve the Lord anymore. Listen to me. The early believers never 
did anything like that. They said, you beat us for preaching Christ and you beat us for getting souls saved and planting churches. They rejoice evermore. And that is what the Lord is telling us and is saying, rejoice evermore because of all these things and the devil is, you know, raising up this and raising up that. The devil is not happy that souls have been saved, that churches have been planted, that saints have been developed and saints have been matured. Look at verse 41. And they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. They were rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name and daily in the temple. They didn't stop. You will not stop. I said you will not stop. Whatever happens and whatever does not happen, we're not going to stop. The Lord has called us. He has given us great commission. said, go preach the gospel to every creature. And while we're doing it, whatever is happening daily in the temple and in every house, they cease not to teach and to preach Jesus Christ. That they, that's the attitude they had because they were saved. And because we are saved, a grace has not changed. That means what I mean is that the grace of God that they had, that's the same grace we have. And the kind of righteousness they had, that's the kind of righteousness we have. And the Christ they had, Christ has not changed. The Christ they had is the Christ we have. If we have the same Christ as they had, the same grace as they had, and the same heaven we're going, that they went is where we're going, that means then as they rejoice in their tribulation, in their persecution, which you will keep on rejoicing. we we'll rejoice in Jesus' name. I'm looking at Romans chapter 5. In Romans chapter 5, I'm reading there from verse 1. It tells us, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. See, we are not Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. It says, we are saved because of that justification and because we now have peace with God and we know that should we die today, we go to eternity with joy. We go to eternity with assurance that our names are written up there. Christ, our Savior, is waiting for us and the Lord God, our Father, is waiting to receive us. And the Holy Ghost is comforting us here. He's saying, it will not be long. It will not be long. Endure a little bit more. Endure a little bit more. And then we're going to get to that wonderful place that the Lord has gone to prepare for us. He said, because of that we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And it says, and not only so, but we glory in tribulation. It says we actually glory in tribulation. We say, I praise the Lord. I know the Lord. I praise the Lord. I'm a child of God. How do you know you're a child of God? Number one, the Spirit of God is bearing witness in my heart. I'm a child of God. Number two, the devil is so angry. is causing all these trials and is causing all these uh, tribulations. And because of that, I glory in that tribulation, knowing that tribulation Tribulation work at patience and patience experience and experience hope. We, we, we go to another passage of scripture and we're not looking at, uh, we're looking at Philippians chapter 4. And you're going to see what the Lord is telling us through the Apostle Paul. And he says, in all these things, we're more than conquerors because we're rejoicing the Lord all the time. In Philippians chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 4. Philippians chapter 4, we're looking at verse 4. Here is what it says in verse 4. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. It's saying all every time rejoice. Every time rejoice. It's saying uh, rejoicing should not just be a temporary thing. There are some people that you know, they must have some courage. And then they try to put on a plastic smile, a kind of rejoicing as only on the face, a kind of excitement only on the face, a kind of you're okay, they say you to be glad and to be rejoicing, and then outwardly when somebody is there with smile and put on a smile, and it's so phony, and it's so fake, and it's not real. But I'm talking about a real kind of joy, a real kind of happiness, a real, because, you know, it's coming from the very source of the fact that, you know, the promise of God, you know the presence of God, and you know the future I know what the Lord has promised and because of what the Lord has promised that's why you are rejoicing and it says over here that from the death of your heart, the gladness and the joy the excitement that you are a child of God and you are following the Lord and you rejoice in the Lord it will be difficult to rejoice outside the Lord in fact it will not be right if you are not in the Lord, it will not be right if you are just in the world and just in sin and you do not know the Lord to rejoice, the Bible is very careful to tell us how to rejoice and when to rejoice is when you are in the Lord. You are saved. You have to rejoice. 
you are sanctified, you have to rejoice. And then the presence of the Lord is in your life, you have to rejoice. And then the word of God is abiding in you. And your name is in the book of life. You rejoice in the Lord. And it says always in the day, in the night, in the day of prosperity, you rejoice. In the night of adversity, you are rejoicing. It says again, I say unto you, if you missed it the first time, I'm saying the second time, rejoice. And then it says in verse 5, let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. In verse 6, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your request be made known unto God. It tells us then, rejoicing, rejoicing, rejoicing is what we do every time because we know we're children of God and we know the Lord is on our side. And then it says, while we're rejoicing like that, look at verse 7, and the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, while we are rejoicing, remember this, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Actually, our rejoicing depends on what we are thinking about. If we are thinking about the actions or the activities of the enemy and the actions and the utterances of Satan, if you are thinking about things you shouldn't be thinking about, it will sap your energy to take the joy out of your life. But when you think about Christ, when you think about his provision, when you think about his power, when you think about his presence, when you think about his promise and prophecy, when you think about the future, when you think about what the Lord has got to prepare for you in heaven, and you know that whatever you are going through now, it is just a temporary thing. It will so come to an end. Then you are able to rejoice and rejoice and rejoice evermore. Then he tells us in verse 9, those things which thou hast both learnt and heard and, and received and seen in me, that you do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Are you asking, Paul the Apostle, what are you saying here? He's saying, have you seen something in me that I rejoice, even in the prison I was rejoicing? He said, you've seen that in me. He said, do that as well. Where is that? That's in Acts of the Apostles chapter 16. Acts of the Apostles chapter 16, and I'm reading there from verse 19. Acts chapter 16, verse 19. And when her masters saw that the hope of their gains was gone. They caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers. In verse 20, and brought them to the magistrates saying, these men being Jews do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to, to receive, neither to observe being Romans. Then he tells us in verse 22, and the multitude rose up together against them. Against them. And it's not just a, you know, one person against Paul and Silas, two people, three people, ten people, a multitude. They were against Paul and Silas, and they rose up against them. And the magistrate traced off, rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And it says, and when they had laid many stripes upon them, not a few stripes, I want you to put yourself in the picture. If you were there and you were to beat him with Paul and Silas and you were to go through all these uh, kind of treatments and punishments and persecution, what would you do? How would you be feeling? But you know, Paul the Apostle, he lived out what he preached. Many of us who have been preaching and many of us who have been declaring the word of God, the truth of God to other people, when some things come upon us, that's when we know the reality of what we have been preaching, what we have been telling other people. Here, Paul the Apostle, I've been telling other people, rejoice evermore. I say again unto you, rejoice, rejoice in the Lord. Now it came to him, the trial. It came to him, the persecution. It came to him, the rejection. It came to him the tragedy and now look at the attitude i'm reading from verse 25 and at midnight paul and silas prayed and sang praises unto god and the prisoners heard them they sang before the trial they could still be singing during the trial and during the trauma that came upon their lives they prayed and they sang praises unto the lord and suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaking and then it says and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bands were loose and that tells us the experience of those uh, old time uh, believers, old time patriarchs and old time apostles and preachers of the word of God. They rejoice and 
she with you at this very time we can rejoice to you and we need to keep on rejoicing as we keep on rejoicing i pray that the presence of the and the goodness of the lord will be upon our lives in jesus name I, i'm reading now i'm reading the word of god here to you it tells us what the lord is saying and it tells us what we're supposed to be doing today and what the glory that ought to be in your life in my life in our lives all together the believers a deep-seated confidence in god's love and the power on behalf of his own and then he appreciates god's righteous character and god's faithfulness which in trials and troubles he in himself the lord has demonstrated so wisely and then he tells us that the believers knows that everything will be according to his own profit everything will be according to the provision of the word of the lord the knowledge that god in his providence god in his power god through his promises orchestrates everything for the benefit of his own of his own lord brings a constant joy and the privilege of prayer and the promise to answer prayer and the provision that all our needs are met in the lord and then the godliness and the gift of god's word that has given to us that makes us to rejoice evermore out of gratitude for the promise of a future glory we rejoice as we walk in constant fellowship with god here on earth that means we find the power and the presence of the lord nearer to us than anything in the world nearer to us than all the all the things the vicissitudes of life that's the reason that causes the joy and then it says and when we hear those words enter into the joy of thy lord then shall these words rejoice evermore have an eternal uninterrupted fulfillment and before then we shall keep on rejoicing and then when we get to glory we keep on rejoicing ever and ever and ever and i pray that that joy as it begins now will never be interrupted in your life in jesus name and let us understand that the joy we're talking about is that we're able to rejoice at all times and in all seasons and we're not only limiting our joy to the time when things are all right when things appear not to be all right we still keep on rejoicing still keep on rejoicing come back to first thessalonians chapter 5 i'm reading from verse 16 rejoice evermore what a commandment rejoice evermore what a statement rejoice evermore what an injunction the lord is giving to you and giving to me and giving to every one of us rejoice evermore how ashamed we ought to be that we ever complain about anything on earth how, how kind of ashamed we ought to be we ought to cover our our faces because we have been full of complaining but now we're telling the lord i know that all things work together for good to them that love the lord and to them who are called according to his purpose and because i know all things are working for good that's why i can rejoice and that's why you can rejoice and that's why we're going to now follow the commandments of, of the lord and say lord i'm rejoicing i keep on rejoicing i come to point number two now the admonition on praying at all times we come to first thessalonians chapter five first thessalonians chapter five and we're reading from verse 17 pray without ceasing pray without ceasing before i comment on without ceasing i need to talk on that pray pray without ceasing the command is to pray but the question is how do we pray because a person may pray without ceasing and yet he's not praying aright. There is a right way of praying and there is a wrong way of praying. We do notice that in the Bible we're told about some people that prayed the wrong way. And if you were to pray the wrong way and then you prayed the wrong way without ceasing, it will all be in vain. There will be no fruit to that. There will be no profit to that. You are praying without ceasing, but you are praying the wrong way. Do you remember those uh, prophets of Baal? They came and they said, Baal, hear us, Baal, hear us. They were praying the wrong way. And if that's not the way to pray without ceasing, then you remember the Pharisee that came into the temple, and then he was praying and praying and praying. He prayed thus with himself. And he said, Lord, I thank you. I'm not like other men. I'm not even like this uh, public and if you prayed like that all your life praying without ceasing without ceasing but you are praying with like the pharisee it will bear no fruit at all and then you know that you know there were other people that prayed and they were not regarding the word of the lord and what if a person for example will abandon the word of god what if a person will not be obedient to the word of the lord and he says all i know is to pray 
All I know is to pray. It's not listening to the word of God. It's not obeying the word of God. It's not believing the word of God. It's not standing for the word of God. But all I know is to pray. And the Lord says, pray without ceasing, pray without ceasing. And yet it's not obeying the word of God. That's not the way to pray without ceasing. Well, look at Proverbs, for example, chapter 28. Proverbs chapter 28, reading there from verse 9. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 9. It says, He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be abomination. Can you imagine, you know, so called uh, church goer, so called uh, Christian, Christian in quotes, nominal Christian? He never hears the word of God. He never reads the word of God. He never believes the word of God. He never obeys the word of God. And he says, I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm praying without ceasing. That kind of prayer will be useless because uh, you need to take in the word of God and accept the word of God at face value. And that is what makes prayer without ceasing actually useful. Let's look at James chapter 3. Pray without ceasing, but pray aright. Don't pray with wrong motives. Don't pray with a wrong, uh, under wrong uh, premises. In James chapter 4. I'm reading there from verse 3. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask a means that she may consume it upon your loss. It's talking about the motive there. If they prayed with the wrong motive, even though they were praying without ceasing, that will not amount to anything. The Lord is telling us then, find the way to pray aright. Find the way to pray aright. And if you're going to pray aright, you need to look at the scriptures. How do we pray aright? Because it is when you know praying aright and praying the proper way, praying the scriptural way. Then you'll be able to pray without ceasing the way the Lord is telling us. Uh, what does that mean? Number one, pray to the Father. Pray to the Father. There are some people that will pray to the founder of their church and they pray to the leaders of their ministry, of their congregation. That's not prayer. That's not prayer. That's not the right kind of prayer. Pray to the Father. That's what Jesus said in John chapter 16 and verse 23. John chapter 16 verse 23 it tells us it said and in that day ye shall ask me nothing but whatsoever ye shall ask the father ask the father in my name that I will do whatsoever ye shall ask the father in my name he will give it you that means number one pray to the father number two you pray in faith we we'll pray in faith that's, that's what makes prayer without ceasing that's what makes it effective that's what makes it uh, you know proper and scriptural i'm looking at james chapter 5 james chapter 5 and we're looking at verse 15 james chapter 5 verse 15 it says and the prayer of faith shall save the sick the prayer of faith that means then, if we're going to pray without ceasing, notice all those points. Number one, you pray to the Father. Number two, you pray in faith. Number three, you pray with forgiveness. You pray with forgiveness. Look at Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11. I'm reading there from verse 22 all through to verse 26. Mark chapter 11, verse 22. And Jesus answering says unto them, Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say uh, unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart but shall believe that those things which he says shall come to pass he shall have whatsoever he says therefore verse 24 I say unto you, what things soever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye receive them and ye shall have them verse 25, and when ye stand praying, forgive when you stand praying, forgive. When you stand praying, forgive. If ye have ought against any, that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive ye your trespasses. But if ye forgive not, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. What if somebody is just praying without ceasing? Animosity in the heart, hatred in the heart, malice in the heart, of forgiven spirit, all bottled in and dwelling inside him. And he's an angry man. It's a, it's a man full of hatred and full of all these uh, negative attitudes. Pray without ceasing in that attitude will not do anything for you. Will not do anything for anybody. But when you forgive, we we'll pray to the Father, number one. We we'll pray in faith, number two. We we'll pray with forgiveness, number three. And then number four, we we'll pray without filthiness. We we'll pray without filthiness. That means our lives are cleansed, our lives are washed, our lives are according to the word of the Lord. And it is praying without filthiness. That is actually what makes praying without ceasing uh, that that is what makes this a uh, very useful and very profitable let's look at first timothy chapter 2 
First Timothy chapter 2. I'm reading there from verse 8. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands, holy hands, without wrath, without doubting. Without wrath, without doubting. And then holy hands were cleansed from all filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit. In second, in second. Corinthians chapter 7 verse 1 Having therefore these promises dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit perfecting holiness in the fear of God. You pray to the Father, you pray in faith, you pray with forgiveness, you pray without filthiness and you pray without fainting. You pray without fainting. That's exactly what Jesus Christ said that men ought always to pray and not to faint. And the Bible says having this ministry, having this promise Promises. Having this word of God, we faint not. We faint not, therefore, because we're not looking at things which are seen. We're looking at things which are not seen. That means then, if we're going to pray without ceasing, it's not just that I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm praying, but you pray to the Father. And then you're praying in faith, and you're praying with forgiveness, and you're praying without filthiness, and you're praying without fainting. You're also praying with fervency. Your heart is there. Your mind is there. You know, some people that pray, they open their eyes, they're looking here, they're looking there, and they're watching something, then they go to the kitchen and, you know, put off uh, something, then they go to the wardrobe and pull out something, and then they're still praying, and then they're, you know, they're, they're wanting a child, they don't, don't you do that again, and all that, and their, their minds is another place, and yet they say they're praying, you know, because, you know, they're praying without sin, and they're counting something in their hand while they're praying, and then they say, you know, we're praying without season because, you know, well, as we're counting that thing, counting that thing, counting all those bits, we're still praying, praying without season. You know, my brother, is, that's not the kind of prayer the Lord is looking for. You are talking to God. You say you are talking to God. You are not giving Him attention. And your mind is not there. Your heart is not there. We pray to the Father. We pray in faith. We pray with forgiveness. We pray without feelings. We pray without fainting. We pray with fervency. In fact, it tells us in James chapter 5. James chapter 5. And I'm reading there to you from verse 16. James chapter 5. We're looking at verse 16. Confess your faults one to another. And pray one for another that she may be healed, the effectual fervent prayer. The effectual fervent prayer, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And then we pray for the fruit. We pray for fruit. And the fruit of evangelism. What a wonderful way to pray during this time that we are concentrating on addressing souls into the kingdom. The fruit of evangelism into the kingdom. And we are praying before we go out, we are praying. And while we are going out, we are praying. After we have gone out to witness and to preach the gospel to people and many people have come to the Lord, we are still praying as well. And it is that kind of praying, praying without ceasing, praying for fruit. That's the kind of prayer the Lord is asking for. We are not praying for the mundane things of this life. We're not praying for toys. We're praying for treasures. We're praying for great things. We're praying for blessings that will last and abide until eternity. We're praying for souls that will come into the kingdom, remain in the kingdom, and then abide till eternity. Look at Psalm 2. I'm reading from verse 8. The kind of prayer we ought to be praying praying for souls. That's the way Daniel prayed. And that's the way these great men of God, that's how they prayed. And that's what the Lord is telling us about that we ought to pray. Praying without ceasing. Look at Psalm 2 verse 8. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. You pray to the Father, number one. Number two, you are praying in faith. Number three, you pray with forgiveness. Number four, you are praying without fieldiness. Number five, you are praying without faith. Number six, you are praying with fervency. And number seven, you are praying for fruit. And when we pray that one, we are praying incessantly, unceasingly, and we are praying without ceasing at all. That's when God says He's going to answer. It's called importunate praying. That's called persistence in praying. We are coming to First Thessalonians chapter 5. And I'm joining those two things together. Verses 16 and 17. Rejoice evermore. Something's Something has happened, and those things that have happened, they are not all positive. And yet you are rejoicing those. Lord, you told me to rejoice. I'm going to rejoice. I believe in your promises that things are not going to be like this forever. And because things are going to change, that's why I'm rejoicing. But while rejoicing. It, do, it doesn't mean that I'm accepting everything the way it is. I'm, I'm believing that God is going to change circumstances and is going to change things. That's why I now I add to that rejoicing and then I pray without ceasing. We need to understand days of praying without ceasing. Maybe it's said to be, it's like breathing without ceasing because prayer is the breath of the spiritual life. He who lives cannot possibly cease to breathe. Well, we can say 
a breeze without ceasing to keep on receiving grace for every need in our spiritual life. We must pray without ceasing, just like we say to keep on living. We must breathe without ceasing. We're dependent on God. Or for every good sin we need for life and for godliness. Without Him, we can do nothing eternally significant. We can do nothing eternally rewardable. As we feel the dependence at all times, we always be in the spirit of prayer. You pray without ceasing, that means you pray constantly, you pray continually. Praying without ceasing is not like commanding us to be in perpetual activity of kneeling down and interceding every time. It's just calling us to prayer as a way. As a way of life, a marked by a continual attitude of prayer. As we think about praying without ceasing, we can look at the life of Jesus Christ. How did he do it? He did other things. He taught, he walked, he preached, he slept and rested, he even found time to eat, and yet he was in a constant dependence upon the Lord, upon the Father. Constantly and continually, he prayed therefore. It, that doesn't mean that he was perpetually on his knees and unceasingly saying prayers without doing anything else. He prayed without ceasing by continually depending upon the Lord, upon his Father. Continually seeking God's for guidance and then listening to God's voice from heaven and frequently talking, taking time apart being alone without Without neglecting divinely appointed responsibility and duty, he was praying fervently to receive help from above to do God's will. God's, God's calling on our lives demands that we be praying without ceasing. That means praying at all times. That means praying daily. That means praying with importunity that we may obtain help and mercy to find grace in the time of need. That's what the Lord is calling us to and that's what we're going to do. And I pray that you will do it and I will do it and as we we'll keep on doing it, the blessings of the Lord will never cease in our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Ephesians chapter 6, I'm reading verse 18. The kind of prayer we pray as we pray without ceasing. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 6 and we're looking at verse 18. Praying always. That's praying without ceasing. Praying always. And it says with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all sins. When it says praying without ceasing, it's not calling us to a selfish life of praying for ourselves alone. Oh Lord bless me. Oh Lord bless me. Oh Lord bless me. And then everywhere we go, oh Lord bless me. And some people, you know, they've written it on the fridge in the kitchen. They read, write it on the mirror in the, in the bathroom. And they write it everywhere. Oh Lord bless me everywhere bless me everywhere bless me not, not that kind of selfish prayer we pray for all the saints we pray for the preachers we pray for the gospel we pray that the word of the lord may find free cause and then move freely and then many souls getting saved we pray all kinds of prayer for all kinds of people that's what it means over there now in philippians chapter 4 philippians chapter 4 i'm reading there from verse 6 philippians chapter 4 we're reading from verse 6 it says in verse 6 be careful for nothing be anxious for nothing. Be worried about nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. That's the call he has given us. And that is the call we're going to obey. I come now to point number three. And it is the affirmation of thanksgiving in all things. The affirmation of thanksgiving in all things. We're looking at uh, First Thessalonians chapter 5. And we're reading there from verse 18. First Thessalonians chapter 5. We're looking at verse 18 in every scene. Give thanks. In everything, give thanks. Now, you'll see that uh, in verse 16, when I read, rejoice evermore. I told you, that's reaching to the believers, not sinners. I told you, the limitation of that, when it says rejoice evermore, that the sinner that has the condemnation, the damnation, and the punishment, and the perdition of a sin hanging upon his neck, he can all say, I'm laughing, I'm rejoicing, I'm glad because I'm going to hell. No, you cannot do that. He's talking to believers. We need to understand. And also when, when we came to pray without ceasing, I explained that to you, that we cannot tell that to a person that is worshipping Baal, or a person that is, is praying abomination before the Lord, or a person is not counting the word of God as anything, and that you have to understand that that means the people who are righteous, the people who are children of God, and the people who base their prayers upon the praying ground, upon the, on, upon the ground of grace, and the provision of the Lord when he says pray without ceasing, the same thing here is 
in every sin give thanks how do you understand that first of all we need to qualify that in everything apart from sin in everything apart from backsliding in everything in everything apart from satanic activity and you think about a nidab and abihu they just offer straight fire before the lord and then they died instantly under judgment are you going to tell aaron rejoice in everything rejoice that your two children have died in sin you cannot say that now come about come to achan achan went and then he took that sin the forbidden sin he shouldn't have taken and then the people of israel lost the battle 36 people died and when joshua was receiving that news then you come to joshua you say now rejoice in everything he says no this one is because of sin you cannot rejoice because of achan let's come to judas iscariot and see what judas iscariot did when he betrayed the lord and then the lord jesus said it were better that the millstone were hand upon he said it were better it were not born are you going to tell judas iscariot rejoice evermore because of that a punishment that is going to come upon you and so when it is something satanic, when it is something concerning sin, we're not going to say, okay, I'm rejoicing because it says rejoice evermore. It's saying while you are in the Lord, while you remain in the Lord. And this is not talking about sin. This is not talking about satanic activity. This is not talking about witchcraft or evil spirit. While you are in the Lord, then something happens like trial, like persecution, like adversity, like poverty, like the things that happen normally in life because you're a Christian. It says at that time, in everything you rejoice evermore everything except sin and as and sapphira came before peter and then they offered something which it was a lie and then how has satan filled your heart are you going to tell the church to rejoice because of what Anas and sapphira are doing he's talking about the people who are righteous who remain righteous then will remain in joy and they will say i'm rejoicing i'm giving thanks in everything everything except sin everything except evil why do we do that why do we give thanks always you want to look at romans chapter 8 verse 28 romans chapter 8 and we're looking at verse 28 the reason we rejoice evermore and the reason why we're praying without ceasing the reason why we're giving thanks in everything it says and we know that all things work together for good to them that love god and to them who are the called according to his purpose that's the reason why we are giving thanks unto the lord thankfulness thankfulness to god uh, and glorifies god acknowledges his goodness and faithfulness it demonstrates our trust and confidence in his wisdom we're saying it will turn out to be good it will turn out all right because we know that god is in control and since we know god is in control that's why we're giving thanks you will if you think about it it is normal and natural to give thanks at a receiving some good things from the lord and or to be thankful in everything when but to be thankful in everything when we have not seen the advantage of an apparent adversity in real christian virtue is real christian virtue that is when you say this adversity but i know adversity is god's university that is the lord is allowing this in my life he permits this in my life what he could prevent in his power he has allowed in his love in his wisdom and because of this i know that this adversity is his university to teach me to train me to tell something to tell me something i wouldn't have known except this happened that's why we're giving thanks to saying oh lord i don't understand this i don't know this i don't see what is going to come at the end of this book i'm rejoicing already i'm praying without us already and in everything i'm giving thanks because i know this is going to eventually work for my good under the old covenant and even in the gospels most people give thanks after seeing the manifestation of god's goodness and god's power and god's presence but it is when you are able to rejoice and you're able to give thanks when you have not even seen what is the end result that that is the quality of the real children of god the lord is calling us to a life of thankfulness and is calling us to a life of praising him and glorifying him and giving him thanks in everything at all times because we know that literally all things except satan all things except satanic activity all things will work together for good to them that love god and to them who are the called according to his 
purpose. It means in persecution, give thanks, give thanks. And then in prosperity, give thanks. In adversity, give thanks. Because we know everything will work out well eventually. And as we look at, let's look at Daniel and see this great man of old. And this is a written for you and for me for learning upon whom the ends of the world are come. So that you will rejoice when such things, when things like that, when they happen. Because you know that the end of it will turn out to be all right. I said the end of everything will turn out to be all right in Jesus' name. In Daniel chapter 6, I'm reading there from verse 10. The story here is that uh, the people, have, uh, they have just uh, signed something. And what they signed is that uh, anybody that prayed to this God, he was going to be thrown into the lion's den. And then Daniel knew that. And after he knew that, what did he do? Did he just go to the corner of his house and say hi about this kind of thing and shut all the doors? Why is the situation in the world like this at this time? How is it that they will not even allow somebody to pray to his God. How is it that they against religion, against me, against God, against everything that is wonderful, everything that I stand for, they against it. But you know what he did? He went to his house and then he opened the door, just as I did as usual, and then he prayed and gave thanks to the Lord. Read it for yourself in Daniel chapter 6 verse 10. Daniel chapter 6, I'm looking at it in verse 10. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks. Do you see that? He prayed and he gave thanks. You know, the Bible tells us the record that even when it appears negative, everything was in the reverse. Everything was against him. It was, his life was threatened. If he would do the same thing, but then even though he knew his life was threatened, he said, this is adversity. I'm going to take it as God's university. It's a test of my faith. It's a test of my trustworthiness. It's a test of my faithfulness. It's a test of my loyalty. It's a test of my conviction. They are trying to say that if they threaten me with the lions, then I will not be able to praise the name of my God. I'll not be able to give thanks anymore. But then he went to his house and then he prayed and he gave thanks to his God as he did a full time. I pray that that same kind of conviction, that same kind of dedication to the Lord, the Lord will give to you, will give to me, and to give to every one of us learning from this Bible study in Jesus' name. So that whatever is happening and whatever the enemies are doing in everything will be given thanks because the Bible says that this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you, concerning me, concerning every child of God. In Ephesians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 17. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 17. We're talking about in everything, not in some things, not in a few things. And also the majority of things in the things that happen at home, the things that happen in school, the things that happen in college, the things that happen in your place of work, and the things that happen in your neighborhood, in everything, giving thanks to the Lord. It says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 17, wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is, and be not drunk with wine, when in his excess, but be filled with the spirit. And I can tell you if you're if you're filled with the spirit and the spirit of Jesus joy and the spirit of gladness and the spirit of, of, of the Lord is in your life, in your heart and dwelling and abiding in you. You are going to give thanks because you know the spirit knows the end from the beginning because he is God and he knows the future even from the things that have happened and he says you will be speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord giving thanks always how many times are we giving thanks Always, in how, in how many things are we giving thanks? In all things, giving thanks always for all things unto God. For all things unto God and to the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. What a glorious thing that we children of God, we can do that because it's not just it's a commandment of it's our nature. The Lord has so changed us now because he abides in us and the word of God abides in us and we know that what we're to do is to give thanks in all things. I'm looking at Colossians chapter 1 verse 3. Colossians chapter 1 verse 3. We give thanks to God and, and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ praying always, always, always for you. You hear about the people who are being converted who are coming to know the Lord and the people who are now in these new churches who are planting that adds to your giving thanks in everything. It's blessing the work of our hand. It's blessing the ministry. It's expanding his church. It's establishing his church. It's building his church upon the rock of ages and the gates of hell cannot 
overcome it. And because of that, we're rejoicing every time and rejoicing always. We're looking at chapter 1 of that uh, Colossians and we're looking at verse we're looking at verse 12. Colossians chapter 1 and we're reading there. Verse 12, we're giving thanks unto the Father which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the same same light. It says because of the inheritance he has given us. That is why we're rejoicing, rejoicing, rejoicing every time. Chapter 2. In Colossians chapter 2 verse 6, it says, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk ye in him. Verse 2 now rooted and built up in him and, and established in the faith. As ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. We abound in the Lord, abide in the Lord with thanksgiving. It tells us in Second Corinthians chapter 2 verse 14. We are thanking God because of the triumph. We are thanking God because of the victory. It tells us in chapter 2 verse 14. Second Corinthians. Now thanks be unto God, which always, always, always causes us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. He it says it's because of that we are rejoicing. And you know, eventually when we come to the end of the road, we come to the end of the journey, to the end of our pilgrimage, and then we see what the Lord has done. Done for you and done for me and done for us and done for his church. And then not just for our church, for, for many people that are calling upon the Lord all over the world. And eventually the kingdoms of this world, they become the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then will be our joy and thanksgiving forever and ever. I'm going to read from verse 15 of, of Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11 verse 15. You see the things that are happening today. There's persecution in your community. Persecution in your area. Problems all around. Then you are wondering how can we rejoice? We keep on rejoicing because we know the end from the beginning. We know the end because we see it in the book of Revelation that the victory and the glory and the worship, the adoration, the blessing, everything is going to belong to our Lord. And his church is going to be the exalted church. The people that actually know the Lord were going to rejoice forever. But why don't we start the rejoicing now? Why don't we start the praising the Lord now? And why don't we start the giving, unto, giving thanks to the Lord even now? In Revelation chapter 11 verse 15, it says, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in, in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And it's at that time now we know all the hosts of heaven will join us who have been given thanks here on earth, and heaven and earth will combine together in giving thanks unto his holy name in verse 17 saying, we give thanks to Lord God Almighty which art and was and art to, and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee uh, thy great power and has reigned. When the Lord shall reign as King of kings and the Lord of lords. And then all the promises of God come into fulfillment. And all the prophecies of the Bible come into fulfillment and culmination in the reigning of Christ. Then we'll rejoice evermore. And then we'll be praising the Lord without ceasing. And then we'll be giving thanks for everything. But as at now, here we are now. And the coming of the Lord is very near. And while we're here now on a pilgrimage. And while we're here now praising the Lord and worshipping the Lord and abiding in Him. Is telling us there's something we need to be doing. This is the responsibility, practical responsibility of the children of God and the practical, triumphant attitude that we ought to have as a people of God. And they are here reaching to us three things. Number one, you rejoice evermore. Take the sorrow away. Take the sadness away. And don't think about the negative thing that has happened and this has happened. Whatever has happened, God is still on the throne. And Jesus Christ is still the master of all circumstances. Because of that, take that sorrow away from your heart and then rejoice evermore. And because of that, pray without ceasing. And then because of that, in everything, you give thanks. Why? This is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And since this is the will of the Lord and you are a child of God, and you are saying that will be done on earth as it is done in heaven, this is what will bring his kingdom in your heart, 
in the world and then in eternity universally you have that kingdom therefore do what the lord has said rejoice do what the lord has said and pray do what the lord has said and give thanks in everything let's rise up to uh, right now on our feet and then we're going to pray we're going to start that what the lord has said all that sorrow take all that away all the suffering take all that away and say lord i said i don't understand why that happened i don't understand why that is happening and uh, whether there's job or there's no job whether there's wife or there's no wife all right that this has happened that has happened that has not happened that has not happened then you just rejoice rejoice evermore it is in the state of that rejoicing you're going to actually find that the blessings of god will multiply in your life while paul and silas were singing in the prison while they were praising the lord in the prison that was when that blessing came and then the foundation of their prison was shaking that's why the lord is saying rejoice rejoice you are persecuted rejoice you are misunderstood rejoice you are slandered, rejoice. You are insulted and abused, rejoice. You are disappointed, rejoice. The things that will worry and make other people to get anxious, it says don't get anxious and don't get worried because of that, because your life is precious in the sight of the Lord. It says while you are praying right now, rejoice and then make up your mind that this rejoicing will become a habit. You are rejoicing evermore. You wake up in the morning, rejoice. Afternoon, rejoice. Evening, rejoice. You look back about this past few days unexpected things have happened i didn't expect that to happen i didn't expect that to happen in the midst of it all my brother my sister rejoice and don't go about uh, you know a uh, challenging god and questioning god and say why should this happen my brother who are you to ask god why did this happen the lord has told you what to do whether you understand or you don't understand you know or you don't know it says rejoice evermore be faithful, be loyal, be, com uh, be committed to the Lord, and just rejoice, rejoice evermore. And then pray without ceasing. Make all your needs known unto the Lord, all your requests known unto the Lord, all your anxiety and all the worry, all the things that bother you, make them known unto the Lord. The Lord is saying, come and tell me, come and tell me. That's why the Lord is there, and that is why he paid the price on the cross of Calvary, so that all the provision we will ever need from here to glory land, everything will be available. Therefore, you pray without ceasing. But remember, not selfish praying, remember not prayer of abomination. Remember, it is not just me and me and me all the time. Myself, my wife, my father, my mother, my husband, my children, my parents. No. You pray for the harvest of souls to come in. You pray for laborers to come into the harvest field. And you pray for the kingdom of God to expand and to be established. You pray that the church of the Lord will be what the church ought to be. You pray without ceasing. And now, in everything. Literally, in everything. Literally, in everything, you give signs because this is the will of God. Pray that God will help you to abide and to remain in this will of the Lord. Your salvation, that's the will of God, and your sanctification, that's the will of God, and you're walking according to the word of God in all righteousness all the days of your life. That is the will of God. Remain and abide in the will of God, and then giving thanks every time when something happens. And then you're saying, what should I do now? What should I do? Remember, the will of God is the first response to that thing that happens. Oh Lord, I give thanks to you. Before you understand, I give thanks unto you. Before the problem is solved, I give thanks unto you. Before other people even come to say, can we help you? Can we help you? Give thanks unto the Lord, because this is the will of God concerning you. Remember today, and remember this is to continue your life. You keep on rejoicing. You keep on praying. You give on. You keep on giving thanks unto the Lord, and the Lord will perfect His will and His way in your life. In Jesus' name.